Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, without further ado, this is my presentation, uh, CLI application development made easier with Typer. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, a bit about myself. My name is Vinicius, Vinicius Gubiani Ferreira. I'm from Brazil. I work at Azon Technologies. I work as a quality assurance team lead for about a year and a half now. Uh, every now and then I work on open source projects. I think the most amazing project that I worked was translating the Python documentation for Brazilian Portuguese. And uh, I also love craft beer, my favorite one being Vice. Prague is a really great town for trying beers. If you know any place that have craft beer, let me know. And riding a bike back in my town. I don't even own a bike myself, it's a rental I rented per year, which is viable for me. I don't do maintenance on bikes. And uh, our schedule for today, we're going to talk about the motivations for this presentation, like answer the big questions such as why am I here, why are you watching me, what reason I decided to do this presentation, what problems you can and cannot solve with CLIs. Then we're going to uh, get to know Typer and a few of the other libraries and packages that uh, do the same job as Typer, just to get some other that may be familiar for you. Then we're going to start with some code into getting to know type or how to actually create a, a CLI application. And uh, to wrap it up, we're going to discuss a use case back at Asium and put side by side the pros and cons comparison. So first things first, the motivation for this presentation, a CLI in 2023. Why? That is the big question, right? And if you have no idea what a CLI is, it's pretty much any application that you run only using your terminal and can be known for other terms such as client application, CLI application, and some other terms. And uh, there are at least, I think, two big reasons to develop CLI applications. The first one that I decided to bring over here is mostly to hide complex operation and make any program actually easier to work. And uh, there may be actually lots of different variations from this scenario, but I decided to pick one that I think it is the most recurring one, which is dealing with APIs. And uh, dealing with APIs usually goes something slightly like this with the story. Here's our user, and uh, here's actually the first thing you always have to do when dealing with an API, is actually create a token to authenticate yourself to ensure you are who you actually say you are and you have the necessary permissions. And then if you get a token, then you're probably going to have to do something with your data that you actually want to change, like post, push, or, sem or patch something, and then you go to another endpoint. But uh, then after you get that, that data, then you're probably going to need to confirm if the data that you actually have and want is actually a valid data, then you have to go to another endpoint, and after you get that, you go to another place, you've actually figured out that the first place you're actually going was not the correct place, and that can goes on and on and on, and uh, by the time you're actually done, you're probably going to be mad, frustrated, annoyed, pissed off, or whatever other feeling that you're actually feeling over here. And uh, I think some of you that actually use the API development before might have this feeling. I see some people nodding their heads over here. I think they agree with me. And uh, this life shouldn't actually be like this way, be hard. Like, it should be something simple, like, I want to go from A to B. That's it. How that is actually, it should be. Like, I want to get into my car, I want to turn the keys, and I get to, want to get from A to B. I don't care how the engine actually works, what's happening, I can, but uh, it might not be necessary for me. But uh, uh, CLIs tend to go into that way from trying to make things simpler, so just from A to B. And uh, another good, interesting point to develop CLI applications is mostly to think about improving user experience and developer experience. And uh, let me know if you ever found a situation like this one that uh, it, nowadays it still happens a bit with me. You found a repository on the internet that it says it solves your problem, but it doesn't tell you how. It's just magic, it just happens. And uh, the developer have a mindset of something like, it was hard to develop and the user should probably figure out by himself and of course, I blurred out the parts over here that identify the repository, the author, just in case by any chance he's actually in the audience and I'm gonna hear bad words from him. I don't want that to happen. And uh, usually, you go for documentation for that case. And documentation, every now and then, is very often we see is just 
a single line of code, and I picked this repository because this doesn't even have one line of code. It's actually half of line of documentation, so that, that makes it even, even worse. And uh, CLIs are a great way to improve on that because if you use the dash dash help option, then you already put documentation inside your application. So after this brief intro, let's talk about Typer and uh, the competition of Typer. And even for Typer is actually great in doing its job. It's not the only tool out there. I'm going to quote some other tools that are actually available. Some of them are actually being showed up here at Aero Python 2023. I think the most famous one that has been around for a while, it's ArgParse. Uh, if you Google it on the internet, then it's probably going to be the first one that actually shows up. Some people actually believe that it comes along with Python because the documentation for ArgParse, if you go to docs.python.org, then you're actually going to find the documentation for ArgParse. So it's been, I don't know, maybe from Python 2.3 or something like that, that ArgParse has been around. Then there's also Click, which is also a great tool. And uh, this is actually the engine of Typer, is actually what is running uh, underneath Typer, because Typer mostly has a new layer of code on top of Click and makes using the library itself easier and uh, simpler with a more modern Python approach. And uh, we also have a Pew, which is being discussed here at EuroPython, I'm not really sure which day and time. And uh, I read the docs for a Pew on a quick resume, and I quite couldn't grasp it how amazing it is, at least compared to Typer. So if you have some time to spare, please check out the presentation. I don't remember the name of the person right now of a Pew. And there are other tools, many others. I know Bloomberg is also doing a presentation about their CLI. Uh, and uh, there are tools that look like tools to develop CLIs. For example, uh, Fabric and PyDoIt, PyPeer. But they are not exactly CLI development tools. They're more like Python script automation tools. So yeah, uh, lots of presentation about CLI development this year. So thank you for coming to my presentation instead of other people's presentation. I really appreciate that. And uh, speaking about Typer features, uh, the biggest feature is actually it takes a lot of advantage on Python 3.6 plus type declarations that uh, we saw a little bit before in the presentation about Pydentic. And this is probably where Typer gets its name from. I didn't see any specific place saying that explicitly, but uh, I guess it's probably where it gets its name. Uh, it has auto-completion pretty much out of the box. You don't have to do a lot of things to get auto-completion working in your CLI application. And if you use any modern IDE, such as Visual Studio, uh, JetBrains, IntelliJ, PyCharm, what else, Atom, and some others, then you just install the package and any necessary complements into the IDE, and you're going to you're gonna have auto-completion when you are developing. So it's going to work just fine. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's focus a lot on developer experience, like you're going to help a lot your users into creating your CLI application. Uh, it's powered by click, as I mentioned, and, uh, but with a more modern approach with Python. And it has 100% code coverage and 100% type annotated code, which is something hard to achieve, actually. And uh, getting started with Typer is really easy. I always like to cover installing the necessary packages. And uh, the first one, you just pip install Typer. And the actual recommended way is actually installing Typer all, which you add two other packages. One of them is actually rich, which is responsible for formatting and showing beautiful information on your terminal, which you'll check it out ahead. And uh, also Shellingham, which I hope I pronounced all right, is a package responsible for actually figuring out what shell are you using, because you can have uh, Bash, Zen Shell, Fish, PowerShell, and many other, I don't know how many shells are nowadays, many, I think. And uh, then you also have two ways of actually using tab autocompletion. You can actually uh, use it by using the typer CLI, which you install it with that way, or by actually creating a Python package with uh, poetry, which is the recommended way. It's very simple and straightforward to install poetry. You use that line. And if you never used poetry before, you're still using pip. That's OK. I'm also going to cover about that. So all languages, frameworks, and packages, etc. they all have a hello world, and typer is actually no exception. This is the hello world of typer. It's Pretty simple, just five lines of code. We just 
uh, import typer itself, and then we create an implicit command. We're gonna cover commands in a couple of slides ahead. And then uh, we just run our application. And what happens when we try to run this code? It's an error, of course, because nothing happens all right on the first attempt. But this is, the blame is on us because uh, we forgot to pass an argument. And we can already see Rich and Typer doing its magic, all these yellow and red boxes. This is all, we didn't program in nothing at all about this. This is all in Typer and Rich. And what it's saying over here is actually that we forgot to pass an argument, that argument is required, and uh, there's nothing I can do to help you out. You must supply me with that actual value. And if we call the dash dash help option to see more information, then we already see pretty much the same information, but uh, without the error, of course. We can see the argument, uh, it has, it's called name, and it is required. And finally, if we pass that argument when we actually execute it, then it just executes our implicit command as expected. It's just saying hello to whatever is the name of the person that we actually wrote over there. So our previous code didn't much look of a, like a real application, like I said in a previous talk. Uh, hello world is not something that you place on production. And uh, let's improve on that. This is starting to look more like a real application. Uh, we're now gonna learn about comments. And I'm gonna highlight over here what actually changed. These are the important parts over here. We're actually, after importing Typer, creating a Typer application and assigning it to a variable. And after getting that variable, we get lots of attributes and uh, methods available for us. And probably the most important one is the commons decorator. And in case nobody uh, is aware what a decorator is, a decorator is pretty much a method that attaches itself to another method. And uh, what we do over here, we mark specific Python methods uh, that can be used by our CLI application. And at the last line, we just execute our application in a slightly different way from what we did before. If we try to uh, ask for help about this application, we can see at the bottom over there, the two commands, the two methods that we created are already available for us. And the commands are pretty much any action that we want to execute with our CLI application. And uh, we can see on the right that uh, the user doesn't actually need to know what's going on under the hood, the Python code that is actually being executed. He just knows about the commands and any necessary arguments or options. And uh, I mentioned before about type declarations for Typer. And uh, just in case if you never work with type declarations, uh, doesn't have a clue what is that, I decided to cover it over here. It's pretty much this, what's going on in this method. We have two parameters a name, which is a string, and a formal, it's a boolean, it can assume true or false. And uh, the biggest difference I decided to highlight over here is that the first one is actually an argument, it is required, and the second one, since it already have a default value, then you can choose by yourself if you actually want to pass that or not. If you don't pass, there's not uh, gonna be error, any error or any problem. The problem is just gonna uh, take the default value and carry on. If we ask for specific uh, guidance called the dash dash help option, then we can see once again uh, Typer doing its magic. Since it's a Boolean, it can only be true or false. It created two options, dash dash formal and dash dash no formal. And the uh, option is actually the way uh, name it for CLI applications uh, when, you have a default, when you have a default value in your argument. Uh, one thing that I decided to mention over here which I find really amazing. Usually we don't document Python, Python code, uh, only when really, really necessary, but documenting with uh, Typer is actually recommended to help your, user while your users out, and uh, there may be different possibilities in documenting your code. I decided to bring one over here that is probably the most easiest and uh, magic, I believe it is. You just add simple triple quotes, comments, into your comments, and literally, but literally by magic, uh, when you call the dash dash help option, they are transported directly for your users. And I'm really at least surprised by me because a comment is not actually executable Python code. I have no idea how this is actually ported for the final CLI application. And this is rather interesting for me. Uh, I have to check Typer code later on to find out how it is actually doing that. There are other ways into documenting. You can actually document your arguments, your options, and you can even use the Typer CLI to 
export your code, your methods, your signatures, uh, and uh, your triple quote comments into Markdown, and then place it on GitHub, GitLab, or any static site hosting. If you want to have your whole uh, comment, your signature, documented for your code if they ac actually want to check everything that uh, your application does. And uh, you might have noticed before about this option over here, the install completion. This is actually how we set up auto-completion, which is when you're using your CLI and you start to hit tab and the program auto-complete for you to help uh, your users, to help you and your users. What happens over here, you use the typer CLI and uh, you just type typer space dash dash install completion. Then it says that it's gonna install for you on uh, your terminal, a specific file it already set, then it tells you to re either restart your terminal or to source that specific file. And from now on, if you use the typer CLI or the Python package, then you have auto completion out of the box. Something similar to that, you just go with typer, the name of the file, and you start to hit tab. It already suggested for us run and you choose. We choose is used for creating the markdown that I mentioned earlier, and run is actually used for running your comments. We can see that they're already filled automatically. And uh, we also have the possibility of creating subcommands. And uh, wait, what exactly is a subcommand anyway? So a subcommand in the CLI world is pretty much a comment that goes after another comment. For example, we have this line of code is Docker container ls. Docker is actually the program, container is a command, and ls is a subcomment. So it's a good rule, but not a perfect rule. Not everything that comes to the right of the command is actually a subcomment. For example, we have this line, and uh, almost at the end, uh, these are not actually subcomments. We have subcomments, but what we have over here are arguments. Uh, we have the program, a command, a subcomment, and two arguments. Uh, because they can change, they are not registered inside the code. And uh, a good piece of advice regarding creating CLI applications is mostly to try to avoid these long lines, such as this one with Git, and similar as this, because this tends to get your users rather confusing. They, they're not gonna be able, most likely not gonna remember all this whole line of sequence. They're either gonna have to hit tab a lot or go to the dash dash help option to figure out, to learn, to remember. So try to keep your comments, the whole command line execution as short as possible to help them out. And a, a quick example about subcomments over here. And uh, I'm gonna try my best to explain because I have actually four files to display and they don't actually fit the whole slide. And uh, uh, it might be slightly hard. It's probably the worst part of this entire presentation because it's hard to make them fit into the slides. And, uh, this particular application, uh, it's a fictional application, of course. We're gonna play the role of a conqueror from the old centuries and try to manage our lands or kingdoms or towns, etc. So what we have over here, we have a main.py file, and we're actually importing another command, another file, which is called lens.py. And uh, inside that lens.py, we're actually importing two other files to help us manage our reigns and our towns. And uh, then, those are two different files. With the reigns.py file, then we finally have two specific subcommands, which allow us to conquer a specific reign, or if they don't surrender during battle, just destroy it, burn it down. And similar with cities, we can actually create a new city to found it, or once again, burn it. Very Nero style, not cool, it's not cool at all. But uh, this is just a fictional example. And uh, some people might be wondering if this is actually possible to do with just a single file instead of multiple files to create subcommands and uh, Absolutely, Typer actually allow you to do that. But this might not be the best approach because whole projects with a single file are not the greatest approach ever. And uh, you get the risk of uh, running into conflicts if you're not, uh, if you have more than one developer. And you also lose some interesting things which is to use, for example, code owners from GitHub and GitLab. And uh, about packaging and publishing, I find it interesting to cover this in case somebody is actually uh, don't want to use the typer CLI. 
the recommended way, as I mentioned before, is by actually using poetry. And uh, if you never worked be with poetry before, that's right, I have a one minute quick resume over here. You just create a new poetry project, and then you enter the folder of the project, add your Python package that you feel that you actually have to use. Poetry doesn't actually create a CLI for us by default, and then you just have to tell it that. You open pyproject.ml and add just these two specific lines, which is your CLI application name, over here I call it EP2023, and uh, the actual path for which function you want to execute when running your CLI application. Then tell Boetry to build your application, add a PyP token to upload to pyp.org, and finally tell Poetry to publish it to PyP, and that's about it. It's ready to be shared with anyone that you'd like, and for yourself. And uh, to wrap it up, I'm gonna quickly discuss a use case uh, that we develop a CLI application at Asium. And uh, if you paid attention during my self-presentation, you might have noticed that uh, I mentioned I work as a QA, a quality assurance. And now some people are actually thinking, wait, he works uh, with, as a QA, so why is he actually using Typer? And better yet, why is he actually using Python at all? So part of my job is mostly to develop tools to do CI/CD integration tests, and many other quality assurance issues and tasks that come along, mostly to unblock people, to help them out. And uh, we have a project back at Asium, uh, before Typer, uh, which is called Development Environment. This is literally the name of the project, and that's why engineers don't work at marketing department, because we're not great at naming stuff. And uh, the purpose of this project is like to manage several projects together. As, uh, in, as an integration test and any other type on local development. And uh, you can think of this as such as the ring from the Lord of the Rings, like one to handle them all. And uh, this, in theory, sounds great, but in reality, it's slightly different. Like, people have different results, different CPUs, different memory architectures, different logics of Python or any other project that you want to manage. So the works on my machine is actually a real thing. We get different results with this project, depending on many different variables. And uh, the worst part, this project, it has a Docker Compose file to manage everything. But unfortunately, some of the projects, they also have a Docker Compose on themselves. So that actually makes it harder to not say uh, almost impossible to manage everything like this. And uh, to try to work around this, the fact that we have more than one Docker Compose file, we created years ago something that at least sounded a good idea back then, which was a make file. And um, let's just say it got out of hand, to so not say worse things. So it become hard to maintain on the long run. And uh, when you change something, uh, it might get a chance of breaking things for other people. And uh, to make things even worse, uh, nobody is really responsible for this project. It's a collaborative approach into trying to get everything working together. And uh, after Typer, you might have already figured out what we did. We developed a CLI with Typer. It's everything that I've been working so far. We didn't deprecate the whole project uh, right now. We're actually going to keep the Docker Compose. Uh, we're working on top of that. But the make file will actually want to deprecate it but, uh, because it became really hard to maintain it. And uh, the first thing that we actually do, we dynamically remove the depends on part because when we try to start a service, we started, I don't know how many other services, one chain after the other. So lots of things were starting when you didn't request them to be started. We got results like feedback from teams saying, ah, I can't start this service. It takes a lot of RAM. I don't use it, etc." So that's something that we already started to work on top of that. We start services now individually, and uh, we created Python profiles for each specific team. And uh, we organized this make file into a new application, a Python application, uh, being uh, split into different teams with different profiles. We're able to actually, in the future, restrain permissions using code owners from GitHub. But unfortunately, we needed extra Python packages because uh, with the make file, we already had things like Docker and Git out of the box, but uh, we ended up needing a few extra two or three packages to do stuff. And uh, here are the side-by-side -side results that uh, I got uh, when using Typer. I noticed that uh, getting results with Typer is 
pretty quickly, like in maybe 10 minutes, something like that, you get your first application up and running very easily. It has a big focus on developer experience, both for everybody who is using or who is actually developing. Uh, keeping your code organized is something that, compared to the Makefile, I found it really amazing. Uh, restraining the permissions was a great bonus point. Type annotations is our first class citizens, as well as documentation and debugging. If you ever try to debug something with a Makefile, you probably know what I'm talking about. Then uh, with Python, is way much better. And the downsides that I noticed, uh, you're probably and likely going to need other Python packages. You're not going to be able to change the world alone with just pure Python. And the CLI might not be the best solution for everyone. For example, if you're doing maybe computer vision or GUI development, something like that, then CLIs maybe, maybe are not for you. And uh, here are the references if you want to check the presentation uh, later on. I'm going to share the slides so you can actually click on them to get more about uh, how this presentation was made. Uh, if you have any questions, here's my contacts. Uh, you can catch me on any of these links. I'd love to hear your feedback, whether it's good or bad. Uh, please uh, refer to me. There's also Slack. I'm going to be around into the conference until the last day of the talks, so please reach out for me. And uh, a big thank you for the EuroPython Commission uh, Society for organizing this conference. It's pretty amazing. Thank you for you for staying until the end, for coming and watch me. Thank you, obrigado, merci, vielen Dank, uh, arigato, I can't pronounce that, sorry, I tried. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free, free to ask. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. We have time for just a few more questions. If somebody has a question, you can step up to the microphone, which is over there. And if we, yes, there is a question, please. Hi, Yaroslav, thanks for your talk. Thank you for uh, You mentioned that you can use it for testing APIs. So is there some easy way how to integrate it, for example, into fast API or some framework? Uh, Just to put the decorators on top of the <laughs> fast APIs decorators. Uh, I think it's actually possible. Uh, this package was actually created by the creator of Fast API. I forgot to mention that. It's, uh, he considers it the equivalent for developing CLI applications. I think uh, there is, there might be a decorator. I'm not really sure. I have to check it out, the documentation, something like that. But I think it might be possible. With Python code, you can do pretty much yeah. anything you like. So it's just a matter of figuring out how. OK, thanks. And maybe the second question. Is there some options how to disable it? Because if it's desired to test something, then maybe you don't want to run it on a production, so just. Yeah, yeah, it's probably. Mm, I think it might be possible. Once again, I have to check the documentation for that. But, okay. Uh, well, probably on code, I think. Not sure if it type already has something by default. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for the question. The next question, please. Hi. Uh, so if you had an app CLI application already coded in arc parse, would yeah. you transition to Typer? What would be the advantages mm. of that? Um, mostly I believe that uh, with Typer, you probably have less code and more of your own code. With, uh, with arc parse, uh, the code for arc parse is actually going to be injected in the middle of your application, more like uh, even maybe some disperse, and you're probably going to have a lot of code. With Typer, I believe, mostly you're going to need the decorators itself, because they're not actually at least in the middle of your code. And uh, it might be possible also to achieve some results that uh, with arc parse might be slightly more complicated. For example, splitting the CLI application into multiple files. At least I think it is actually harder in arc parse. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, if there's more, no more questions, then let's have another round of applause for Vinicius. Thanks for the talk. Thank you.